ask your question, please stand and take one of these microphones and speak into it clearly so everyone around you can hear you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, good to see a full room. I was very um, sad about the prospect of this getting canceled because I was very excited for this conversation. So I'm glad we got it in, I think, just under the wire before uh, <laughs> there are no longer events in DC. Um, I'm Dan kurtz uh, Welcome to the uh, issue launch for the, the latest issue of Foreign Affairs. The theme, as I think all of you know, is Come Home America. And we have three authors of um, some of the lead pieces from, from the package. Um, it is an issue that has some other big names in it, especially in the essay well, including a former vice president and a presidential contender. We have three Nobel Prize winners in the issue, so um, it None should be. Uh, that's, that's not us. It, it is not the people up here, none of whom, <laughs> to my knowledge, have won Nobel Prizes and none of whom have um, presidential aspirations, as far as I know. But um, this really is the, great, uh, the greatest group we could have put together from this issue, because they really get, between these three pieces, get it. Um, the heart of what I think is kind of the big question for U.S. foreign policy and, and grand strategy today, which is really this question of whether we are overcommitted, we're overextended in the world, and whether we should really be um, embracing retrenchment or restraint in, in a new way. Um, let me very quickly introduce them. You have their full bios in, uh, in your packets. Um, we have uh, Tom Wright. Tom is a senior fellow at Brookings. Um, most notably, he was talking about great power competition before it was cool, I think, I think it's fair to say. He wrote a book. <laughs> that came out three or four years ago um, on great power competition and what it meant for US foreign policy. Uh, by any means necessary, get, what's the, uh, the title? All Measure Short of War. All Measure Short of War, sorry about that. Um, a, a great book, but has really been um, uh, writing on these themes and questions for a long time. His piece is The, the Folly of Retrenchment. It, it leads off the package. Uh, then we have Kath Hicks. Kath is the director of the International Security Program at CSIS, at the Center for Strategic International Studies. Um, she was a senior Pentagon official in the last administration and um, really combines, like few people in Washington, both the guts and mechanics of defense policy with the big strategic and policy questions. So um, was the perfect author for uh, her piece in this issue, Getting to Less, which is about defense spending and, and what it would take to really reduce it. And then finally, we have Stephen Wertheim, who is a, a historian by training, if I, if I have that right, um, but is now one of the founders of the Quincy Institute, which is um, really driving a lot of the discussion of the retrenchment and restraint debate, uh, a new think tank here in Washington that has uh, uh, really stood up really fast and become a, an important source of, the, um, of that view in this debate. Um, there are three other pieces um, by people who are not based in, in the uh, um, DC area, so they were not able to be here, but including one by um, the great realist scholars, Jenny Lind and Daryl Press, another by Graham Allison, and finally a piece by uh, Steve Krasner, the great Stanford political scientist. And, uh, Bush administration policy planning director. So all great pieces, but we're really lucky to have um, these three here with us today. I'm going to spend about half an hour talking to them, and then we'll uh, hand it over to members for questions. So um, hold your questions until then, and there'll be plenty of time for discussion. So um, I want to I start with a question that I want to put to all three of you. Um, I'll start with Tom, and we'll go uh, to your right from there, <coughs> which is really about how you understand the history of uh, the last 25 or 30 years. You know, in some ways, this argument is about how we see the errors or successes of uh, post-Cold War American foreign policy. And I think all three of you have slightly different readings of what, what went wrong and what went right. So let me ask each of you to uh, t tell us what you think about that history. Is it largely a record of failure, as um, Stephen and the other retrenchers uh, say? And whether you think it was largely a failure or not, um, what were the, the chief mistakes and what were the greatest successes? Yeah, thanks, and it's really great to be here, and, and thank you for including me uh, in the issue. Um, yeah, it's a tough question to answer, I think. My, my colleague Bob Kagan has a thing he says about this, which uh, I think is a little bit useful, which is what 30-year period would you choose in world history, right? I mean, if you could choose a 30-year block, which one would you take? And the point is that they all sort of suck, right? There's, there's sort of problems with each of them, if it's the you know, 1900 to 30 or 30 to 60, uh, you know, 60 to 90, they all have different problems. Some um, are better than others. And I think that gets to an important truth, which is, 
you know, one of the first things we lose, we, we learn about foreign policy when we start studying it, which is it's largely a question of choosing between your mistakes or the downside, right? There's really very little, very few options where it's all upside or it's the right answer and it's the wrong answer. And, you know, Stephen and I disagree, as I think is evident in the articles. I think we would both agree that whether it's retrenchment or not, each comes with its own set of downsides and trade-offs, right? So you're trying to choose uh, which you think uh, are more manageable and where you think the benefits outweigh those, rather than saying, you know, my problems don't, you know, my, my solutions don't have um, problems. Having said all of that, um, I think if you look back over the last um, 30 years, I think to me, sort of the successes are, uh, you know, the, the great sort of globalization that took place and, and rising prosperity uh, around the world. Um, and then the problem on the other side of that is that that essentially became unmanageable in 2008 or 9. And I think what happened in the response to 08, 09 was one of the great foreign policy successes on a bipartisan basis uh, in sort of the American era since World War II. Interestingly, that success is an orphan. No one claims it because it's politically unpopular. But what they did, um, I think, and as Dan Dresner has shown, it really avoided a great uh, depression. So I think you see that sort of arc there. I think the Middle East um, is, I think, the area of failure. Um, and then we can get into the reasons um, for that. I think Europe and Asia policy have been uh, much more successful. You know, and so I see it netting out um, as, as pretty successful, relatively speaking. But I wouldn't sort of deny that, that the problems that I think have arisen. Uh, I, I think I mostly agree with the way Tom would frame that, particularly at the end. Of, you know, I, I see, in general, a, a trend line that has a lot of positive aspects that I think reflect good foreign policy approaches, and then some really egregious mistakes, I think, uh, have to be talked about. So because you picked 30 years, that happens to correspond almost perfectly with my time <laughs> working in, uh, in this field. So right, obviously, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm invested in some ways, of course, in the answer and not unbiased. Um, but what I see first and foremost is, of course, coming out of the Cold War, just a tremendous ability of the United States to work with allies and partners abroad, manage a significant decline in U.S. presence overseas, its military forces, the peace dividend, as we called it in those days, to sort of try to create a pathway with Russia and the Russian Federation uh, in terms of a way ahead. You know, I think there were many, nonproliferation is a huge priority, which I think was a very successful, particularly through the non-Luger program, very successful approach, um, and nonproliferation in general has been, in general, a very uh, positive aspect of the past 30 years. And then you get to kind of more the Steven Pinker lines, right, where you have global health improvements absolutely over the last 30 years. You have um, the middle classes rising, in particular, of course, in China and India, helped significantly by the U.S.-led international institutions. Um, and uh, you know you have middle classes growing, et cetera. So there, there, there's some good news stories in there. If I get to 2001, I can't, I can't in any way defend the the decision that was made to undertake the invasion of Iraq. I think that was a tremendous mistake. I don't think it was a mistake that was, in any way, unavoidable. I think that was the U.S. foreign policy with the particular people who made those decisions just making an egregiously bad choice on very little information. Um, and should be, there's no shortage of what students should study around that for, for years and years to come. Um, then I think what you have following 9-11 is a lot of trying to manage through the implications of that decision. Um, whether it has to do specifically with the implications for how the U.S. executed the campaign in Iraq, how it then executed the campaign in Afghanistan, where there was tr trade-offs, et cetera, having to be made across them, um, or anything going forward in terms of the knock-on effects it had on U.S. foreign policy interests in lots of different areas. So to sort of use the, the frame maybe, that, that again, that Tom was hinting to, I think the Middle East is the area where the U.S. went wildly off the rails and then was trying to recover. Just stepping way back, I think what worries me the most, it doesn't surprise me because every decade of these 30 years, we, we navel gaze, which is good, at how US foreign policy has been executed to try to figure out what, what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong. We're, we're very nervous of our own shadow 
and I, and I get that. But I do think the, t the clock has not stopped. U.S. foreign policy is not over. Um, the implications of any one of these decisions, negative and positive, will continue to play out. And I think on balance, the period in which the U.S. had a degree of um, a supremacy, if you want to call it the unipolar moment, I think in many ways the U.S. did well with that period. Again, the Iraq decision, a horrific example of what happens when you overreach on that kind of power differential. But we're in a different era now. So the question really that's most important is how do we manage through the era we're in now into whatever that next phase in this transition period to whatever that next phase of, of uh, the international system is. And that's a really good area for us to be focused yeah, on. So we'll move to those forward looking questions. But first, Stephen, sure. go through that history. Sure. I think, uh, you know, I recognize some of the most of the successes uh, that uh, Tom and, and Kath pointed to the uh, reduction in uh, extreme poverty around the world, that has to be considered to be a, a major success. Uh, and, you know, we, we haven't seen, uh, we should never take for granted uh, the absence of great power war. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, I recognize that as a triumph. But fundamentally, I have a pretty uh, negative assessment of what the United States has done uh, with an opportunity that it had coming out of the Cold War. Uh, the United States. Uh, if it wanted to, uh, could have worked to uh, build a world of peace where the United States was not forward deployed everywhere and did not start out by dividing the world up into uh, about ha half the world that it sought to protect and another half the world that implicitly or explicitly uh, came to be enemies or antagonists. Uh, and I think What's happened as a result of this pursuit of armed primacy from the 1990s when the costs were not initially apparent because of the U.S. advantage. As that advantage has eroded and also as the United States, not for disconnected reasons, became more and more uh, engaged militarily in the Middle East, uh, the consequences have gotten worse. And now we face a point where uh, primacy has produced exactly what uh, it promised uh, not to produce uh, in the early 1990s. Uh, the existence, potentially, of hostile great power competitors uh, that may threaten the United States or its pretty expansively defined interests. I think that's a manageable challenge, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that. Uh, but this uh, notion of great power competition, I think, has been invoked uh, not to acknowledge the failure of the uh, primacy policy that came before, but to give it a new lease on life. And I think we need to take a much uh, more critical look at that. In addition, though, uh, you know, as you look at, let's say that, uh, you know, U.S., uh, you don't agree with my assessment of U.S. military policy. I think it actually made the American people less safe. We've seen attacks on this country, uh, which did not, I, in my view, need to happen. Uh, but look at the opportunity costs in terms of uh, climate change, for example, which we are now having to scramble uh, to address and are not making uh, nearly sufficient progress. That is a true uh, threat to the United States, the American people, and a threat to humanity. It's clearly not where our resources, our attention have been over the last uh, 30 years. And now we see other transnational challenges like pandemics very much on our minds right now. Uh, which, again, uh, could have absorbed more attention, uh, as well as uh, tackling the concentration of ungoverned wealth, uh, which I think, uh, despite the reductions in extreme poverty around the world, uh, the form of globalization that the United States helped to set up uh, through the World Trade Organization and other agreements, has not benefited enough of the American people. And now we see a backlash at home uh, where, uh, you know, a record of endless war making uh, in the Middle East has, I think, given rise to nativist sentiment in this country, and it's been turned and weaponized against Americans at home. So I would say that the costs to our own democracy uh, also weigh heavily in my assessment, since that ought to be one of the core interests of the United States in its national security policy, but uh, in its overall uh, policy, uh, domestic and foreign. In, in terms of the forward-looking question, let's go to the Middle East first, because I think there is a, a degree of, of agreement between the three of you and much of the broader um, 
uh, foreign policy commentariat and, and policy making class. Um, there is a view that it is our, our policy is over militarized or overextended. Um, but the question of what it would mean to uh, to withdraw or to, to right size that presence, I think, is a is a much more difficult one. So, Kath, let me start with you. If yeah. you were looking over, say, a four year presidential term, what would you want that presence to look like at the end? What would you really do to um, to correct the, from the mistakes that you referred to since Iraq? Yeah, I, I, uh, the first thing I would just say is a d significant degree of humbleness in answering that, and I will answer the question, but in the answering that question, I had a round table I held, I think it was last summer, and I asked a, a broad range of people who were in the room to sort of talk about U.S. Middle East uh, policy, and nothing will get people to clam up more than trying to get them into specifics around U.S. Middle East policy. And here's how I would summarize. I did it in the room to their agreement, and I would summarize it here. If you are to ask people um, if they believe in engaging in U.S. military assistance or intervention in something like a Rwanda, all hands go up. If you ask everyone in the room today, in particular, if they believe in something like the Iraq invasion, no hands go up. If you ask people to comment on U.S. policy in Syria, you cannot get, people get very uncomfortable very fast. And this is the hard reality of what it means to actually execute foreign policy. Not write theory about it, which I'm a political scientist, I'm good with theory. Not uh, extort about it, but actually execute it. And here's where it gets challenging, right? So I think the key elements first in my mind, are the U.S. Um, engagement in Afghanistan, which has gone on for 20 years, will need to end. And I think you can end that while still retaining U.S. military forces in the, in the country in a way that is defensible, both in terms of their own force protection and defensible in terms of politically with the American people. What exactly that size is, I'm not going to get into, but essentially I think you keep a small presence there really more as a regional, uh, regional approach. Um, into your interests beyond just Afghanistan. But by and large, the United States needs to have determined for itself that it cannot move the ball any further in terms of Afghanistan. And oh, by the way, we've been way too militarized in our approach there for some time. Sort of ironic that it's been President Trump who actually has sort of been the, the, the this missing State Department voice, if you will, the voice of what, where, where is this conversation around where the political situation is going in Afghanistan. So that's Afghanistan. I think in Iraq, there is a reason to believe the United States can maintain for at least the moment some degree of continued military partnership. I think the killing of Soleimani made that very difficult. So we're going to have to see how that plays out in terms of Iraqi politics. But there are some advantages, again, to having the, that ability to connect and partner um, as long as and in, until there is not an Iraqi state that can function in a way that protects its own borders, et cetera. And that's a 1,000 troops or a couple thousand yeah, troops? Yeah, it's a know. small number. So again, small ground force numbers. I think the United States has enduring um, interests in and around the Persian Gulf that are relatively easy to protect offshore. Asterix, the cost to do that is significant, and without having forward positioned forces, it's more expensive. So that's something to be worked out, but that's in the maritime realm. And then I do think you get into these really tr tricky issues around in particular, so, so that's how I would handle for the moment the Iranian, Israeli, Iranian, um, Arab interactions in the military sense, again, not touching on the full force of U.S. foreign policy. I think when you get to Syria, that's where we have, if there was a moment for more stepped up military intervention from the United States, it has passed. That is uh, very sad for me to say. I think there were points in time when the United States could have done more to avert humanitarian disasters like we're seeing, but that is not today. We have let that moment go. Um, and so I think continued emphasis on humanitarian assistance and having a much more forceful po uh, posture in terms of the political process where the Russians have really stepped in and the U.S. has been absent. That is what I would want to see. I think all of that is achievable in a, in a four-year term to kind of get us into that posture. Let's go to Stephen. Sure. I mean, I think, uh, first of all, a lot of... Uh, what you say, I think, has been the view of many foreign policy experts and defense analysts for some time. Look, the United States is overcommitting relative to its interests to the Middle East. The question is, where are we now? What's changed? Very little. 
and we're seeing an increasing backlash from the American people who are using the phrase endless war, which I think is, uh, we probably disagree on this, but I think it's a quite useful uh, concept. I think it expresses a sense not just of the longevity of wars, but also the lack of purpose, the lack of an achievable objective or a legitimate objective that the American people feel, and I agree with them. I think the question isn't about scenarios, episodes. Would we want to intervene in a Rwanda-like situation? Would, what about Syria, more difficult? Iraq, no. I think the question is a structural one that we should be asking. What are the interests, are there interests of the United States in that region that justify more than a dozen bases, that justify having intimate relationships with about half of the actors in the region, which have many problems of their own when it comes to values or when it comes to advancing American interests, and making enemies of the other half. So do, does the United States really want to dominate the Middle East? Why is that worthwhile? And we've seen how it's worked out. And I'd like to see if we're gonna maintain the uh, posture of primacy and have forward deployments, and then keep asking in various scenarios, should the pre-positioned United States military step in to try to do good, even though we've seen how that worked out? Uh, I would want to hear what the plan is to actually have a better result from what we've seen so far. Uh, and I don't think there is one. And I think that's fine. I think that's a good thing. I think this is an opportunity for the United States to take a step back. Ultimately, uh, we should want to use our diplomacy, our good offices, in an even-handed way to help bring parties in the region to get, to, uh, together to settle their disputes uh, in a peaceful way. I think that's constructive. We ought to provide humanitarian assistance, be more generous in our refugee policies. That's how you help people who are suffering. It's very hard to help people who are suffering through bombing, bullets, and the like. Can and we've does, seen that. Does that mean pull those troops out of Iraq and closed bases in, in Qatar, and what, what specifically is yeah, that? Yeah, it does. I mean, I think ultimately, if we wanted to keep two bases uh, in the region, that should be enough, maybe Bahrain and Qatar, uh, to provide what the United States really needs, which is maritime access in the event that uh, regional forces or other powers uh, don't preserve openness to the global commons. But aside from that, we should be looking to uh, not just uh, end the war on terror in a pretty rapid way so we don't continue in a dynamic where there are mutual recriminations and then a desire for revenge. Uh, so, you know, I think within 12 to 18 months, uh, U.S. forces, uh, ground forces at least, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and Syria uh, should be withdrawn, certainly in Iraq, where the Iraqis uh, do not want the United States there. Tom, anything you want to add, or do you want to wait for uh, Great Powers? No, no, I'll, I'll just make a few sort of framing comments that might add a little to what has been said. I mean, firstly, I think if you, if you look at public opinion and all of the surveys and sentiment in general, people are still legitimately, I think, concerned about terrorism, right? And I don't believe that the terrorism threat is purely a function of U.S. foreign policy, and I don't think if the U.S. leaves and that ISIS is just not going to attack the United States, right? And I don't think that the reason Al-Qaeda attacked the United States in 2001 was primarily a function um, of US foreign policy. But even if that was the case, I think now it, it definitely um, is not. And I think there still is a continuing danger. I mean, the timing here when Obama sort of pulled troops out of Iraq, one can agree or disagree with that, um, you know, ISIS reemerged and did actually threaten here and key allies and engage in some pretty horrific um, attacks. And so it is, I think, an ideological actor. I think the U.S. needs to retain the capability uh, to prevent their resurgence and also to defeat them if they do uh, reemerge. And I, I don't think that's going to change. I favor pulling troops out of Afghanistan. I'd probably go a little bit further um, than Kath on that, but I would distinguish between Afghanistan and Syria and Iraq. And I think we can you know, debate what exactly the U.S. role needs to be there. We all agree it, uh, at the very most, should be quite small, but I think there is a role um, to be played. And I think if you look at public opinion, public opinion may, when you pose the question, do you favor endless war, I'm sure they say no. Um, but when you look at the Chicago Council polling, 
the only two things they're actually really concerned about is terrorism and China, right? Those are the two things. And the only region they really care about is the Middle East. So it's slightly, it, you know, uh, and, and I know you have polling data that would say yeah, they're against sort of the interventions, but I think it's, it's quite complex. And I, I think Kat used to, when we would talk about this, we used the phrase, or one mass attack away from sort of a, a huge demand to, to go back into the region, which is where Obama you know, found himself. So I, I think it's important to keep the eye on the ball um, on that. The other sort of framing point I would make is that um, you know, one of the reasons why the US, I think, has to pull back from the Middle East to some extent, again, is it's to do with the region and how it's developed independently of US foreign policy. They're linked. But both Republicans and Democrats, I think, wanted to have reform in the Middle East in different ways. And the failure of the Arab awakening basically put an end to that for the time being, right? The hopes of indigenous change that Obama had, uh, the hopes of a more coercive reform um, that Bush had. And I don't think it's really sustainable to have a, a, an intense engagement with no real hope of reform, right? And MBS, MBZ, and others are, you know, are problematic allies. And uh, I basically agree with the points that have been made by other uh, folks in, in the field that, you know, a little bit of diplomatic and retrenchment uh, from the region may actually have a positive uh, impact on the mindset of some of those actors and maybe change the incentive calculation, uh, incentive structure in a positive direction. I want to go to China before going to the audience, but let me at first ask each of you to respond very quickly to um, uh, a version of, of Kath's point about, um, about humanitarian intervention. I mean, when we talked about the use of American force for much of the post-Cold War period, it was really uh, in, in response to humanitarian crises elsewhere, whether Bosnia or, or Rwanda, I mean, interventions we made and, and, and did not actually make. Um, do you still believe that humanitarian intervention should be uh, uh, a core part of American foreign policy and occasion for using force? Um, should that be something we still consider? Let's start with Stephen, just, just very, very quickly, because it was, Kat's point was very interesting. I would never rule out uh, humanitarian intervention in a situation like Rwanda with uh, grave abuses at the same time. And I wish, actually, the Clinton administration had spent more time, in the case of Rwanda, actually looking carefully into what is it that the United States might have done to make a positive impact. At the same time, your question was, should it be a core part of American foreign policy, and perhaps the debate surrounding it? And I think my answer to that is no. I think we have overinvested in this very narrow question where the cases of successful humanitarian intervention, a military intervention that clearly produced better outcomes for other people, uh, there are so few in history, whether it's from our own history or from the history of great powers who have also, since the 19th century more or less, attempted these kinds of things. I don't think that we should be making fundamental decisions like uh, where we position our forces, alliances we make, that is defense commitments we make to put our people in harm's way, uh, based on a fear that uh, you know, there might be some a, a terrible atrocity and we won't be there to solve it. I think we need to get a little bit more comfortable with sins of omission, and there may be sins of omission, and pay more attention to the sins of commission that the United States is making when, for example, it is a participant in the Saudi-led coalition war on Yemen. Uh, so that, I think, is actually maybe one of the reasons why the Yemen issue inspired bipartisan support as a kind of humanitarian non-intervention. Yeah, I think I basically agree with Stephen's main points there. I mean, it's, humanitarian intervention has not been core in U.S. foreign policy. Obviously, we've had some periods where, in particular, as manifested through Responsibility Protect, there has been a push in, for some to increase um, its centrality, <clears throat> pardon me, but that's never really taken, and again, Syria might be the case where we really saw how there was, if you will, if, if it's a sin, it was one of omission more than anything else. Um, 
we always, those of us who work with the military always really tr try to be clear here about there's use of force and there's use of forces. And there are lots of ways in which the U.S. can use its forces and more broadly its foreign policy toolkit, really, to try to be helpful in humanitarian situations that can include the provision of um, assistance, non-lethal assistance, um, food, water purification. You can think of all those things. You can think about the uh, U.S. military's assistance and, by the way, the PLA's assistance uh, in the Ebola response. So there are ways to bring um, to bear the, the investments we've made for greater humanitarian goals, but I don't think they're at the core of how we plan and think and organize ourselves, um, particularly with regard to mil the military. Use of force for um, humanitarian purposes, I think, is very complicated. There's certainly, as Stephen said, I think there's certainly, you, you don't want to take that off the table, but I think you have to be very careful about, uh, very restrictive about use of force in general. There's a reason use of force is the most, um, a a fr this is the highest friction point in US foreign policy. It should be. These are our military <clears throat> personnel let alone the significant, uh, not just lives, but treasure that have to be invested. So that should be the point where we have the most friction, but we need to be able to, to keep ideas on the table for extreme um, exigencies. Yeah, I think one big difference between Stephen and me on this, and I'm open to correction, but my, my reading of our uh, various pieces is that, uh, I mean, I think the U.S. needs the option to be able to do this when required, and uh, my understanding of your position is that the U.S. should get rid of the capability to do it so it won't have the temptation. Now, it's, you wrote a piece in the New York Times on sort of ending endless wars, which was a sort of dramatic cuts to military capability so there wouldn't be that option. And I think, you know, I basically agree with Kat. I mean, no one's, I, I don't think anyone really has, except for a very brief time, made this an organizing principle. But when you think of a couple of thousand Yazidis up a mountain, Right, and the, do you want an option in very quick time to be able to uh, to remove the threat to them or to uh, compel the adversary uh, to allow them to return to safety? Or, or multiple other examples where time is extremely short. Um, I very much want that capability to be uh, to, to to exist, right? And I think we can also talk about the chemical weapons usage and everything. There's all sorts of problems with the use of military force in these cases. There's all sort of hypocrisies that certain types of killing would be allowed and certain other ones would not. And I acknowledge all of that, but I think ultimately uh, you want to have that as an option. And if you don't have it as an option, I think we will see what David Miliband has spoken about, which is this rise in the age of, imp of impunity where bad actors act, uh, you know, really not caring about what the international community thinks. And it is U.S. military power, I think, that has, is a component of encouraging sort of restrained behavior uh, on the part of these actors. Great. Um, let, me, let me close uh, before going to members with um, uh, two minutes from each of you on what is probably the biggest uh, and hardest question in American foreign policy today, which is, which is China. So let me, let me ask each of you to tell us how we should think about the challenge from China and then what we need in terms of both uh, uh, presence and, and alliances in Asia and in terms of strategy more broadly to counter that challenge. Tom, we'll start with you this time. Yeah, um, so I'll do like a, a minute, a minute and a half on right. that and then a, a 30 seconds on the, on the differences maybe between us. I mean, I think of this as sort of a, a clash of governance systems, right? I think that uh, more broadly than the military competition, that our sort of open uh, democratic system is an existential challenge for the Chinese regime, right? That it's not just decisions that are made by the executive branch, right? It is also the freedom of the press, right? With the revelations about the Xinjiang cables or corruption in China, it's the open uh, social media, the internet, uh, you know, business. All of these things, I think, are challenging uh, to the CCP, and they've reacted by increasing repression in China. Their governance system poses huge challenges uh, for us as well. And I think both are sort of understandable from their own perspectives, but we are locked, I think, in a more structural contest. There is a geopolitical and security component of that that we can't ignore. Um, and that brings me to the, to the differences, I guess, uh, uh, you know, with, with, with Stephen on this, is that I think the alliance structure in East Asia is a crucial part um, of, of U.S. strategy. I think you have to have uh, a very sustained and deep presence in the region. You have to deter 
uh, aggression, and then you also have to focus on all of these other sort of aspects of the competition, and you, of course, need to maintain cooperation uh, in various areas, including global health, as we're seeing currently um, on climate change. One thing on just the global health uh, dimension of this, which might be interesting, is I think we are seeing how that is complicated and by uh, the contest with China. Uh, if you look at the World Health Organization, for instance, over the last few weeks, I think it has been uh, affected uh, by China's influence, compromised even in certain respects at the leadership level in terms of what they have said. And so we have spent the last 20 years saying, really good for China to have more voice at institutions. We want them to be involved. We want them to be within the order. And then we have the head of the WHO saying, there's nothing to see here. This is an exemplary response. Um, and so I think we're only beginning to come to grips with that. Obviously, we need China involved, um, but clearly there are complications um, as well. I think I would just um, complement what, uh, with an E, what, uh, but also with an I, uh, <laughs> what Tom had to say um, by talking about us, because I, I do think there is a contestation for sure. I think there is a way for China to rise peacefully. Um, without, not without any friction or conflict, but without armed conflict. Um, I do think having a strong deterrent posture, and we can have a whole side conversation about what that exactly means, because I don't think it means what your grandfather's strong deterrent posture was. I think all that matters, but I think what matters most fundamentally to the contestation that the United States is having right now with China and can expect is strengthening ourselves at home. And boy, do we need a lot of help. Um, so we don't present a particularly compelling model to the rest of the world. We can't attract allies and partners um, as well as we used to be able to, and yet that is the very center of gravity, if you will, of our strategic approach that we need to be strengthening. There's lots of ways for us to induce others. Uh, we could not yell at them. We could <laughs> um, develop a trade ap approaches with them that are mutually beneficial. Um, we can uh, lower barriers to commerce more generally. Lots of ways we can look at R&D investments back and forth. We can spur our own innovation economy. I could go on. I think the key thing here is to not think about foreign and domestic policy as having in any way a bright line. I don't think that's the case at all. In fact, I think our foreign policy will fundamentally depend in this contest with China on the United States being very capable of galvanizing its own society and economy, showing the strength that that has, um, even as we are investing appropriately in our national security tools, which does include uh, military forces. Yeah, I would say that um, China throws up a, a whole set of very legitimate concerns over technology, governance, uh, climate, trade, uh, and also in the military sphere. I want to linger on that a little bit. But I'm uncomfortable with the frame of China or great power competition. This is the thing against uh, which or around which uh, so many people in DC are orienting their activities. I think that you know, the fundamental interest that the United States has in its relationship with China, the one that I would personally prioritize is the fact that China uh, is the, by far the number one emitter of greenhouse gases in the world. Uh, we emit more uh, per capita, but they emit more uh, total. And so the most important thing we can do vis-a-vis -vis China, it's not to squabble over the South China Sea, which I do not think uh, impinges on a core US interest, uh, but it is to try to move the Chinese uh, in a direction that they have shown that in part they want to go, not entirely, uh, which is to uh, both uh, green their economy and get rid of their uh, coal-fired plants in China and join with us uh, in a effort that uh, involves as many different partners in the world that we can get uh, to provide green technology and try to decarbonize the global economy. So I think, you know, when you put it like that, the China problem, it's, a, it's an issue, a significant problem. But it's a problem that is embedded in, I think, what really matters uh, in terms of the interests of the United States and the interests of the world. And so I think that implies something when it comes to the military side. I think we can have a uh, peaceful relationship with China moving forward if we really want to. I do worry, though, that if we try to guard, uh, cling to as much military primacy in the Asia Pacific as we can muster, 
uh, we will end up in a containment-like posture toward China or something that looks to them like a containment-like posture, not without reason. And then the security dilemma logic takes hold and we get into arms races and the potential for great power war or we're back in the Middle East uh, doing the kinds of things uh, that we did uh, during the Cold War, Africa, et cetera, uh, that continue the kind of endless wars that we've seen. So I'd like to avoid very much a Cold War-like scenario with China. I think we can. And I think we should focus on the issues that uh, matter most in which uh, you know, we could use a cooperative relationship with China uh, and not the foreclosure of uh, genuine diplomacy. I'm going to avoid the temptation to ask follow-up <laughs> questions to that and go to members. Um, let me just quickly remind you that this meeting is on the record, so um, uh, just be aware of that. Wait for the microphone and speak directly into it. Stand, state your name and affiliation, and please ask one question. Uh, we'll start in the back. Yeah, my name is uh, Larry Korb. I'm at the Center for American Progress. When you were talking about uh, the attitudes of Americans toward some of these engagements, how do you think it would have been different if we had a draft and we had a, you know, a tax wage to fight these uh, conflicts? Okay, well, I just missed one word, Larry. What ways to fight these if we had... In other words, if... In these wars we fought since 9-11, Afghanistan and Iraq, we mm -hmm. had a draft mm -hmm. and we raised taxes. Taxes, that's what I didn't hear. Yeah, Got okay. it. Yeah, well, I, I, my, I can only assume, um, you running that counterfactual, that that would have um, increased the investment and focus uh, in exactly what we were doing. And obviously there is the potential that if things had just kept going as they have, that there would have been more pressure earlier to change the approach. So I, I think that's kind of a given. I do want to say back to the focus on the US, I certainly don't support going to a draft, but I, um, uh, I do think the failure to have a, a connection, a societal connection across us, which the military service in World War II really sub substituted for, for so many years of the Cold War, I think that's a real challenge we're gonna have to deal with, whether that looks like something like voluntary national service, which I support, incented voluntary national service, so maybe it's loan forgiveness, things like that. Anything that really draws us together societally so that we can connect and that we understand the implications of things like use of force and investments abroad, both on the positive and the negative side. I think that would go a long way to helping Americans. Tom or Steven, want to add anything I quickly? I agree with that. OK. Uh, let's go to the front here. <coughs> Microphone right there. Jamie Rubin, thank you. I'm going to resist responding to guns and bullets didn't save a million Kosovars and bring them back to their homes and I'll involve the uh, war crimes tribal, tribunal uh, trial of Milosevic and then his death and basically a democratic government to that part of the world. And just ask all of you to be, if we're gonna be honest about this, on causes, Stephen believes that our foreign policy caused the conflict with Russia and China, that's what he said. Others would argue that it's our foreign policy that prevents Russia and China from causing wars. And until we resolve that question, we're not, and I commend you all for being so polite to each other when you disagree so profoundly, um, but we need to address the difference between our foreign policy causing the great power conflict, which is essentially what you said, in addition to 9-11 and Trump, um, and your view that we need the foreign policy of the United States to keep peace in Europe and Asia. Tom, do you want to start and then we'll go down the line? Yeah, I mean, Jimmy, I mean, I agree with you. Firstly, on Kosovo, and I, I should have mentioned that in, in the successes, um, I think, you know, the Balkans was a mixture of failure and success, but I, I think it, it was ultimately um, successful and important. And I think that is one of the reasons why we've seen some measures of stability. But on your broader point, um, look, I mean, I'm not saying that the US, you know, that there aren't parts of the policy um, that could be better. I think, of course, that's always true. But yeah, I think fundamentally you've accurately described the difference you know, between us. I, I do not think that the US is the cause of friction with Russia and with China. I think it's quite the opposite. I think NATO expansion means that what we've seen in Ukraine is not occurring 
uh, in the Baltic states. I think the U.S. has been a stabilizing force. I think, you know, Stephen and I fundamentally disagree on the role of alliances. I think you're sort of basically against them in a, if not formally, then in the in the military structure that that supports them. Or as I think Kath and I would see those as crucially uh, sort of important. I don't want to speak for you, <laughs> but I, I think there is a, uh, you know, I, I think that is one. Um, sort of area difference. The only other point I would make is that with Russia, if you look at you know the 09 sort of 10 period, that was an attempt at a genuine reset, and it and it failed. You know, and I think the people who say that it's NATO expansion or it's U.S. aggression really have to grapple with why did the reset fail? I mean, I I was skeptical of the reset um, because I thought it would fail, but but if you believe in cooperation, that was an experiment in real time. And you know, 14, all of that stuff came, came way later. And so uh, to me, that is a sign that what really is going on is events in Russia rather than a policy here. Do you want yeah, to I, I that? would just, I definitely agree. If the, if, the, if the question is around, did the US cause uh, tensions fundamentally with Russia and China or to create great powers? My answer is no. In fact, the criticism in some ways has been that the US in the case of China did too little, if you will, to prevent its rise. So I think, let me just jump ahead on that to say, I still think the fundamentals of the debate are about what shapes uh, Chinese behavior. The argument seems to be around the tactics, but I still would argue, I, I have yet to hear a compelling alternative from any American official in the Trump administration or elsewhere that we have a different goal, such as destroying China or something along those lines. I do think fundamentally this is about how do you um, organize your carrots and sticks in relationships in ways that help uh, manage through a potential conflict, not allow for um, uh, sort of uh, any kind of um, uh, crisis to arise that's military in nature and also protect U.S. interests in so doing. And there I think the U.S. has definitely had its um, problems, but I would not say being too invested in the South China Sea has been one of them. So we can have a separate conversation about what the U.S. has and has not been doing in the South China Sea. But I think that's China. In the case of Russia, it's very clear that the Russians um, under Putin and the period that, that um, Tom referenced is under Medvedev, which of course in a way is under Putin, but was distinct for sure in the way in which they were approaching the US and others. But under Putin, there has been from you know Georgia to Crimea to other examples, a clear sense that they did not feel um, their interests were taken care of. Are there things the US could have done slightly differently? Yes, should it have been about NATO expansion, the EU, or um, any other number of grievances, I think the answer is no. The one I would point to in the military realm where I think the US did itself a significant disservice with regard to the Russians is Libya. And that is a case where the US and NATO, I think, un pushed themselves forward on a military intervention without thinking through many things, least of which was the way in which the Russians would perceive that and then turn it against the West in terms of their own approaches to things like the invasion of uh, and the annexation of Crimea. So I think there are missteps along the way, but by and large, this is where the Russians want to be, and that is where they are right now. And in the case of the Chinese, I think the US is still trying to figure out what that mix of tactics is, um, and, but it's not fundamentally our fault that they are rising. Yeah, uh, I agree about Libya. Uh, to continue <laughs> your uh, the politeness that you disdain so much, rightly so, by the way. I'm just kidding. Um, so I'm being uh, impolite to you, so I apologize for that. Uh, so, you know, fundamentally, I think the reason why the United States should be made the wrong decision to maintain and even extend uh, its alliances in the 1990s and onward, uh, and should be working to uh, retrench today. Uh, it isn't so much that alliances are guaranteed to antagonize other powers. I do think they tend to do that. Um, but it's because they're not in our interest, our security interest. How many of you in the room or how many Americans feel more secure because uh, we are treaty bound to defend the Baltic states? Uh, do we think that the Baltic states uh, contribute to U.S. national security if there's, uh, d does anyone ask? Estonia to step up, um, you know, fundamentally is that the solution when the United States is under attack? 
So I think, you know, that for me, that's the bottom line. Uh, and if a war does break out, we should uh, hope not to be involved in such a war. We should also act to prevent a war from breaking out. And obviously, there are some differences in terms of the extent to which we think that alliances and the deterrence uh, system, in fact, does prevent war. So that's a valid debate to have. Uh, we should point out, though, first of all, that uh, uh, Russia has been uh, an aggressor in terms of territorial uh, expansion. It's a different case when it comes to China. Uh, so yes, the US record vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, I think, has not been uh, so adversarial over such a long period. Uh, but at the same time, all the talk uh, about what a peril it is that China is rising uh, to the United States uh, suggests that this is an issue with great potency. Uh, and uh, our conduct toward China, I think, could uh, get considerably worse and more provocative. And I think we've seen that already starting to happen over the last several years. Uh, so we have to make a judgment somehow. Not easy to do. And yes, this is all very speculative. And that's, that's the game, unfortunately, that, that, that we're in. We have to make a judgment about whether the United States uh, should maintain both uh, forward deployments and an offensive kind of uh, operational strategy towards China. I propose in my piece uh, taking a serious look at a more defensive operational strategy, uh, more like a mutual denial, in which the United States could uh, help its allies uh, defend themselves through A2, AD systems, uh, and then potentially the United States could take a serious step back uh, from its existing commitments, formal or informal. Uh, I think with Russia, it's a little bit, sorry, just a little bit of, of a different case where the United States did do things that consistently uh, impinged on what Russia said were its view of its vital interests. And the uh, Georgia and Ukraine conflicts uh, can be read, you know, not as the sole provocation, and I'm also not trying to assign moral responsibility, but as an important causal part of, of that story that has uh, deteriorated relations significantly. Qu quickly, does Kosovo pass the test for you? Do you see that as a case of um, costs outweighing benefit? You know, it's a, it is a difficult case. I, th I uh, would actually want to make a closer. I've looked at it to some degree, actually, in That's my writing. Funny. And I think it's a difficult case. It did, in the short run, uh, intensify ethnic cleansing. Um, you know, we could argue about the long run consequences in humanitarian terms. There's also a significant cost in the way it was done without UN Security Council authorization, just under NATO auspices, and the cost to great power relations as well. So that's a, it's a okay. difficult one. You two can have an impolite conversation after <laughs> this. Um, let's go to the, uh, the middle, um, uh, my left. Yeah. Thanks. David Goldwyn, Atlantic Council and former State Department. Um, I wanted to ask you all about two of your other fellow contributors in the volume. Uh, Graham Allison, um, in a pretty surprising article, suggests that the way you operationalize foreign policy is to cede spheres of influence, both to Russia and to China. And Steve Krasner more or less says good enough governance, that maybe defending democracy uh, around the world is, uh, is overstretch. So what does this mean, I guess I'd start with you, Stephen, for the defense of Taiwan, for the defense of the Baltics, and whether we should care about what happens in Venezuela in our own hemisphere? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me respond to that and also uh, deal with another question. I mean, I think uh, ultimately what I would like to see is as the United States retrenches in Europe and Asia, the uh, United States encourages its allies to step up and assess the threats that they face and develop mechanisms rather than suppress them uh, to provide for their security. And maybe that's a collective approach in Europe. Uh, or East Asia. Uh, but I think until the United States does that, we are you know, currently, your question and, and others, I think, imply that there's this kind of choice between, well, the United States will do it, or there's nothing. There's nothing there to let you know, potentially aggressive great powers have their way. Uh, and that doesn't have to be the case. We don't have to, you know, in the Middle East, I would retrench very quickly, actually in order to kind of break the logic of the war on terror that we're in, if I were uh, so empowered to, to do so. But um, you know, in Europe and East Asia, I, I would not. I think there should be a more a cooperative approach uh, and one that reverses the 
posture of not just the Trump administration, but basically every administration since the creation of NATO that kind of browbeats the allies for not stepping up, and then we don't take the actions that, that would incentivize them to do that, uh, and, uh, and so they don't step up. Uh, so, you know, that's a kind of long-term answer to the question um, that I think is in some ways, I don't want to dodge, dodge some of the specifics, but in some ways that's the most uh, Im important answer that, that I can give. Okay. <laughs> that was a little dizzying. I think what I would say is that uh, that you just described actually the full functioning of what it is to have defense to defense relationships, right? So I think probably there's this conversation that will take more time than we have on this stage to understand exactly what you're getting at. But yes, of course, the role of those alliances and relationships are in part to grow the capabilities of others. So to use your Estonia example, I actually am a fan of Estonia. I'm not necessarily a fan of endless NATO um, uh, expansion, but I do think that's an excellent example of an ally that has invested smartly in its future. It has grown incredibly good cyber capabilities. It is sharing those capabilities, hosting the NATO Center of Excellence, et cetera. Um, and it's a small country. Of course, it's, it's, it's got a tiny population. Its ground forces are not its comparative advantage. So working with the United States and others, it's going where its comparative advantage is, which is a high-tech, high-intellect society. That's exactly the kind of thing we want to see from allies. Go to your strengths. The Poles have a much larger population. They're going to have more forces they can put on the ground. The ground force is not the only metric, nor necessarily the most important metric for most of the challenges that we're going to see in the future. So let me just first say thank you to the Estonians, and then second say I'm not sure what that was supposed to mean in terms of how you think foreign policy has been executed around defense relationships, but I want to assure those in the audience this is a major part part of what anyone is trying to do at any given time from an embassy perspective, from the combatant commander perspective, et cetera. Lots of particulars that we could get into there. But um, to the Taiwan piece, I think what I would say the challenge of these sort of grand rhetorical yes, no, black, white approaches is these on spheres of influence in particular is that there are countries that are sovereign that have, <laughs> have rights for their people, right? Taiwan is a particularly tricky case. The United States has a one China policy. I think that's the right policy for the United States to have. Um, if you're looking at a Singapore, now let's move a little further out, or an Estonia or others, they don't just sit in someone's sphere of influence. These are free people, hopefully. They're free, at least the ones we care most about. And they have rights as part of the UN Declaration of Human Rights and as part of the UN Charter. So I think this is where it gets really hard, of course. So I take uh, Graham's point about spheres of influence. I think what I would say is, I think when you're talking about countries on the periphery of another country, you do have to worry more, of course, about spiral dynamics and the potential for escalation and the interests of great powers. Um, but by the way, there's lots of great powers beyond Russia, China, and the United States. Lots of nuclear powers, unfortunately, as well. So that, I think, is something you have to consider, but I don't think the world devolves or is simplified to there are now three great powers, the United States, Russia, and China, and that is how we should execute our foreign policy. And for everyone who lives inside those peripheries, I'm sorry, but you are now subject to the whims of your great power nearby. It's so much more complicated than that. Yeah. Can you think quickly? Um, one more. Yeah, sort of two, two points. The first, in, in the spirit of Jamie's question about being honest about the differences, I mean, I think the difference between the retrencher position and the, uh, uh, the more sort of alliance-oriented position is that, Stephen, your conversation with the allies will be, we're leaving, we're going to give you some time to figure it out. You guys figure it out, but ultimately we're leaving, right? And you'll leave anyway, even if they say our preferred option is that you stay, right? And, and, and our position is, no, that you need that presence and you can have these burden-sharing capability discussions between the allies, but the alliances are basically sacred with, with democratic countries at least. And I think that is a huge difference. I mean, what we're talking about here is global posture and it's whether the U.S. is present in these regions or not. And it is a little bit binary the way it's being framed. And I think that's the debate. That's the debate we're having. Uh, and so I don't think anyone should be confused that it's about a sort of a, uh, uh, an accelerated Obama-esque discussion about you guys need, really need to spend more. On the uh, issue, I couldn't disagree more, I think, really with, with Graham Allison and Steve Krasner on, on these articles. 
I, I'll just say one thing about Graham Allison's piece. I mean, I don't think spheres of influence are a stable equilibrium. I don't think moving from where we are to that is stable at all. I mean, saying, yes, you can have a sphere of influence, and we'll sort of discuss where it is, empowers the hardliners. I completely agree with Kath uh, on this. If China can have one, if Russia can have one, why not uh, Japan? You know, why not Saudi Arabia? Why not anyone else? Like, where does this uh, basically end? I mean, the idea of trying to negotiate this under conditions of disengagement, I think, is an act of hubris as, as, as big as the Iraq war or any act of, uh, of invasion or overextension, right? I mean, this is such a complicated uh, uh, strategy to execute that I'm just stunned that, that it's sort of thrown out there in a way that we think we could manage it, right? I mean, if we say to Beijing that they have the right to a sphere of influence in their region, that is an imperial act, right? It's basically an imperial act, and we will be engaging in an act of an imperialism where we sit down and negotiate that over the heads of the people who live in these countries and these places who are actually treaty-bound in many cases uh, to the United States. So uh, I know that's not exactly what he was saying on that, uh, uh, but I think that it is basically sort of an unstable situation. They may acquire a sphere of influence incrementally over time at some cost. If they do that, I'm not totally happy with that, but that's okay, I think, if that's where it ends up and we can manage the problems that arise out of it. But thinking that we can sort of okay it in advance and then negotiate it, I think is, um, I think is overly optimistic to, 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 to understate it. Let's do a quick last question in the front here. Thank you, Chris Miller from the Air Force Academy. Uh, with regard to the foreign policy and national security communities, there's a truism that says that a, an organization or a, a community operates and heals itself to continue producing the outputs that it has produced. So when you look at things like shifting or, or increasing resources to diplomacy, the formation of DHS, but only after 9-11, um, future challenges we can easily see. How do we look ahead 20, 30 years and shift the way our system looks at these things? Uh, do we have to wait for another cataclysm or are there levers that policymakers have to, to force the discussion? That's a good big question. Each of you get um, 45 seconds to answer it. So let's, uh, <laughs> let's, let's, let's start with Stephen. Yeah, that's uh, a tough question. Um, you know, I think we have an opportunity right now at a time of significant change domestically and internationally to put our foreign policy on a much sounder footing and stop the downward spiral that we have put ourselves on by adopting armed primacy as a basically unquestioned objective in the 1990s. And I think if we do that, we can put our defense spending under control uh, and start to rebalance and be a peacemaker in the world that does not over-identify with the use of military force when it starts talking about its presence or absence in the world. And I think we heard a little bit of that in the previous two uh, comments. The United States does not need to be disengaged. In fact, I would have it be more engaged in many respects, including through diplomacy. Uh, but we have to have a fundamental shift of what we say our objectives are in order to make any of that possible. And it also requires uh, a political coalition, frankly, uh, to insist on that. So I think that's clear. And it's kind of beyond the scope of uh, people on this stage uh, to, to, to be able to to bring about that change. Leon Panetta says, uh, his, one of his great sayings is, uh, um, you know, we, we deal with uh, challenges either by crisis or by leadership, and unfortunately it's typically by crisis. I think there is a place for leadership to play, be played here. I think there is an opportunity for us to see that happen, um, forthcoming, and I think a big piece of that leadership is having uh, a much more significant understanding of the multidimensionality of the foreign policy challenges we're facing, which is not unprecedented, but um, uh, but really are hitting us, I think, quite hard right now, and, and particularly in the space between p routine statecraft and, and war. Um, and that should be the opportunity for us to understand once again that we need to reinvest in the State Department. How many times have we been through this, right, even uh, since 
since um, since uh, the end of the Cold War, where we've pushed for that um, greater um, opportunity investment for um, development and aid and, and trade. And I think there's a lot of movement in both of those. We've seen good movement uh, on the Hill side, bipartisan in both those areas. Um, and to grow out things like, I do, I do think climate change is a huge issue for our foreign policy going forward. Lots of new skill sets, um, capabilities, and potentially even reorganizations that make sense. Tom. Yeah, I think we can maybe do five to 10 years. I think 20 to 30 is, is basically impossible. But right at the moment we're in, uh, I think we're looking at a sustained period of deglobalization um, because of a variety of factors, and that's going to be very difficult to manage. We may want to arrest that. We may want to shape it in certain ways. I think we are looking at a prolonged period of competition with, with Russia and China, whatever form uh, that takes. And I, I think we do see these accelerating transnational problems, whether they're pandemics or, or climate. And I think those are you know, things that aren't necessarily all to do with resources either. Like it's not as if we increase the budget by 10 to 20 percent for these things that they would be automatically easier to deal with. Uh, I think they're sort of conceptual. And the way I think about it is that we're sort of at a similar period now to where we were in like 1950 or so in the Cold War in that a lot of the concepts we need to navigate this, we haven't invented yet. So we need to sort of invent concepts like they did with second strike survivability or all of those things, arms control. We need to be working on what are the diplomatic uh, concepts today that will help to sort of guide us through those trends that I don't think will, will, will go away in the next sort of five or 10 years. Well, that is a great uh, reason for foreign affairs existing, I hope, and, uh, <laughs> having a job. Thanks so much to all of you for great pieces Thank and for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.